this teaching to training thing becomes key. And I, and I, what, this is one thing that I've kind of seen through the years where, where the kids that are struggling with, with issues and everything else, you know, I don't need anything that I already have. That if, because if I already have it, then I don't need it. Are you following me? It's a pretty simple idea. If I am valued at home, I don't need to go find value somewhere else. If I'm not, um, if I don't feel appreciated, I don't need to go find appreciate. I don't feel connected with anybody at home. I don't need to go do things to feel connected somewhere else because I have that connection. Are you following me? Now, don't do this. Don't say, well, my child's not connected, so I must have screwed up and done something wrong. That's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying that the motivation behind your child is to look for something. And so I'm always telling parents, then you can do something different and engage differently to meet the needs of your child that, that have an amazing way of affirming the relationship so that if they don't get it somewhere else, at least they have that relationship with you. And so the concept of this teaching, teaching is the first 12 years of their life. Training is the, is the next 12 years of their life. It becomes important to understand that I'm making a shift because they're changing in, in, in their world as well. They are moving. I, I, I made a comment uh, this morning, we were not, not in church, but we were talking about how it's amazing to me how, it, well, even 10 years ago when we said that a, a young girl starts her period at age 10, how people would go, oh, I can't believe that. And now we're finding out and we get calls from people that their daughter's starting at nine or they're pregnant at 10 or, you know, it's just amazing. That's what I did. If you coughed, I, I, I gagged when I heard that the first time. Here's a little girl that, that is pregnant at 10 and you just go, you, wait a minute. And what's happening is, is that, is that the maturity levels aren't keeping up with the equipment that they're getting. Are you following me? And so it, it creates this world of despair where they don't know how to handle the very things they have. The thing that's most discerning, I mean, or disgusting to me, quite honestly, is that mean that they are losing a couple more years of childhood. And so they're forced to grow up earlier and, and it, they're missing out on a very important part of their life. Um, so that's happening with, with our young ladies. With our young men, they're moving from, um, from this concrete thinking to abstract thinking. And it means they just perceive things differently. And I'll give you an example of what that is. We had a young man that was with us that, uh, at, when he was five years of age, 9-11 happened, and he lost his dad. And so concretely, mom said, you're going to have to take care of the dog. Um, you're going to be the man of the family. We're going to, mommy's going to go to work. We need to move out of our house and move to a smaller house. You need to take care of your sister. All concrete things. So he kind of put the absence of his dad to all these concrete things. Well, then he turns 11 or 12 about right here. And he starts thinking about the world differently because now he's moving into abstract thinking. And so what he's thinking is, my dad's never going to see me play basketball. My dad will never see me go off to prom. My dad will not see me get married. My dad will not be around to hold my kids. See how it shifted? So he's almost going through a grieving time again at age 12, the problem is people try to give him this information, if you would, to try to resolve those issues. And, it, and he didn't need information anymore. What he needs at this age, now he needs wisdom. Are you following me on that? His world's changed the way he perceives it. Young lady that grows up as a, as a princess and as princess drapes and princess pillows, and she just thinks she's a little princess. Daddy even calls her princess, and they, and they say, come here, my little princess, and blah, 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 blah. And then she goes off to middle school that I call the princess brawl, and they begin to realize that life isn't perfect. It's not as kind as you think it is. People don't treat each other with a sense of respect. They don't share like they're supposed to. The way you look matters, and so their world just changed. And so what we do is try to go in and tell them, oh, no, you're still a little princess. What are we doing? We're going back and telling them that 
We're telling them more. I'm going to adjust. I know where it is as long as I don't move. I'll just stay like this. And so they, they begin to find out that, that, that she's thinking differently about the world. A kid who's adopted. Does any, do any of y'all have adopted kids? You have adopted kids, and, 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 we, and we do these things. We tell them all these things. We tell them all these things that, that, that we, we got you out of, of a tough situation. Mommy and Daddy love you. We, we provided you. You have a family, blah, blah, blah. But we tell them all the neat things. And we even have this gotcha day, you know, where we celebrate the day that we got them. And they go, oh, isn't this so fun? That's so cool. Now they start thinking abstractly. And abstractly, they're thinking, why was I given up? especially when they start their period and start having these motherly instincts. Why was I given up? Why was I abandoned? Why did somebody not want me? And so this is the grid that they kind of process everything through, that they read everything as being negative. Are you following me? And so, they, so it just means that they're grieving something that happened back here, but they're going through it again. And if somebody said, well, my child doesn't deal with adoption issues, Yes, they do. They will be asking that question, why was I abandoned? When's the next time they're going to feel that? When they have kids of their own. Because they're going, how could somebody have given up? Me. But what happens in middle school, when they start thinking that way, they start interpreting everything that way. That means that if you're looking at me, and I'm that adopted kid that has this abandonment grid. Why is she staring at me? She must hate me. She doesn't like me. And they start seeing things negatively because it's coming. Now, do they understand it? No, not at all. But it's a grid that is because it's because the way they're changing, they see things differently. And if we go back and say, okay, I'm going to give you more information to help you understand that more, then what we're doing is, is offering them something they're not really looking for. Are you following me? What, what, what father, when a, when a son asks for a fish, gives him a rock, a stone? What father, when a son asks for bread, gives him a serpent, a snake? What father, when a son asks for wisdom, gives him information. It just means there's a need to start sharing that. And I, I shared this the other day at a place. I, I started writing books when I was 50. Um, and, and the first time that somebody came to me and said, you need to write, I was sitting there going, I, I don't have anything to write about. There's nothing to write about. And he goes, oh yeah, there's something to write about. I go, I don't think so. I just, I just don't have it. And he goes, Mark, I want you to write me a story about a girl who hates, who hates her father because her mom and dad are going through a divorce. And that's what this man was going through. And he goes, use examples and then tell me some truths out of that. And so he worked with me. And I, what I found was um, that I didn't pay enough attention about outlining things in the fifth grade. But the other part that I found, the other part that I found was I really have learned a lot of stuff. I just didn't realize it until you start thinking differently. And when you start thinking and asking yourself, am I sharing information or am I sharing wisdom? Following me? So it just means that I'm looking for that wisdom component that I want to share with them. Instead of, and wisdom may be that you just keep your mouth shut. Even a fool appears wise when they keep their mouth shut. I just feel like somebody gave me up and abandoned me and nobody likes me. Hmm. That's it. What does that mean? Somebody listen to me. And let me give you some listening skills because it's the next thing that, that we talk about. You move here from talking to listening. And, and this is what I've learned about listening. Um, one, I didn't do a good job with my own kids. And probably don't do as near good a job with my wife that I need to. But kids, I always interview kids. And when I interview kids, it's always asking them questions, which will be the next 
the next slide that says, instead of giving answers, start asking questions. And so what I found was that, that I would ask kids questions and they would respond. And people then would come to me and say, what are you doing to get them to talk at that level? And what I found was, what I was really doing is what I would call reflective listening. So if you listen to our podcast or you listen to radio, one of the days on the podcast and on every radio program, I'm interviewing kids that live with us. Um, now, I don't interview them knowing that that's going to be the topic we talk about. I interview 10 kids in a day, and, um, and then we just place it in the right program. And so what I'll do is say, well, hey, um, here's Cicely. Why don't you tell me about how you uh, ended up at Heartlight? Well, I was doing some stupid stuff. What kind of stupid stuff were you doing? Well, drinking too much and having sex and smoking pot. Why were you drinking and having sex and smoking pot? Well, I just wanted to be connected with somebody. Why do you want to be connected with anybody? Well, nobody really likes me. Why didn't anybody like you? Well, it's because I do stupid stuff. Okay, so why do you do stupid stuff? Because I don't know. It just seems like it was just a pattern I developed. Why do you develop the pattern? Because nobody paid attention. Why did anybody pay attention? Well, nobody's ever paid attention to me. Why hasn't anybody ever paid attention? Well, it all kind of started in third grade. What happened in third grade? Well, I went to this church camp. What happened at the church camp? Well, this lady. See what we've done? All I did was ask her, how'd you get here? And I took every answer that she would give me and I put it in the form of a question. Form of a question. Form of a question. And what it does is this. It affirms to them that I'm listening to what they're saying. But here's the other thing. Do you notice where it goes? It gets deeper and deeper. And just as I made a comment about women, how they talk all the time, incessantly, never stopping. No, I'm joking. Men have a tendency to fix things. And men, if, if you're here, you're guilty of this. You fix things. I fixed something in, uh, in the bathroom this morning uh, at the hotel. Um, room 517 has, I cleaned out the, the, the shower head because it was kind of clogged up and, and just with, you know, like glue and stuff like that. And so I took it apart and cleaned it and I redid it. And, you know, that's my nature. I fix things. I mean, I, the, I, today I was sitting out back and one of these things wasn't working right. So I rolled it on its side and fixed it. You know, I'm one of the guys that I see a light bulb out, I'll tell you, but I'll climb up there and fix it. And I was really looking whether any of those light bulbs are up, but I don't think they are. But I'm, I'm, I'm wired that way, and most men are. But we do that in our conversations. We start a conversation with somebody, we feel like we have to fix it within 15 minutes. So that's why my wife says to me, I didn't ask you to fix it. I just want you to listen to me. There's a young lady named Kara Lee that I started to have a conversation with when she was 14. She stole our car, she wrecked it, totaled it. And so when I caught up to her and everybody got there, I had her arrested and she ended up spending 10 days in juvenile detention. Cute little blonde hair, 14 year old with handcuffs on. I, I sat there and just teared up looking at it thinking this looks so awful. And the guy said, do you want to press charges? And I had the hardest time going, yes. Because I thought her cuteness would kind of win me over or something. So I visit her every day. And, and, uh, and she was angry and mad at the beginning. But then she became a little bit soft. I had dinner with her uh, last July uh, in Denver with her parents. Um, and really, it's the same conversation that we started when she was 14. Because I'm not trying to fix her. I just want to keep the, the relationship going. She's now a grandmother, 51 years of age, just got Colorado Teacher of the Year. I mean, and we've been having a conversation that's lasted for 30-some years. And my point of it is, is that when we start to listen to people, you, you, you get to the point where you don't have to fix them anymore. That, that, that there's something about the way when I tell somebody they need to be fixed. Do you like to be told you're fixed? Do you like to be told you're broken? Do you like to be told that you're wrong? Men, 
Of course you don't. Men hate it. I, I think it's always funny why anybody can tell me I'm wrong and give me criticism, but when my wife gives it to me, I can't stand it. Does anybody else go through that? That hearing it from your wife, the one who knows me the most, knows me the longest, knows everything about me and stuff, I just don't like hearing it from her, but I'll hear it from other people. See, some men are going, yeah, but I don't want to admit it. And, um, but there is something. And so it, it just means that what I'm trying to do is make sure that I'm listening more than anything else. What's the number one thing that kids need? Is to be listened to. Chuck Swindoll made the comment that we did some radio programs together, and he said, he said I, I've got a wor one word that would change the destiny of families. What's that? If they would just listen. It becomes important to listen. Moms, when you go home this afternoon, don't talk for the next 24 hours. Give it a shot. See what happens. And what you want is this. Hey, Mom, are you okay? Hey, Mom, is something wrong? Mom, you and Dad doing okay? Mom, are you drinking again? <laughs> <What>? <laughs> but you see what's happening? They're coming to you rather than you always going to them. When I'm with kids, I got to tell you, I'm a pretty quiet guy. I am really not the life of a party at places. I am I'm pretty quiet. I do things and I, I don't have to talk to everybody or anything else. I do seminars and conferences and I spend my life speaking. But when I get around other people, I don't, I'm, I'm not the life of the party. And, and, I, and, I, and sometimes I, I sit back and, and just say, should I be more aggressive and what I've found is, is that kids will come to me and want to talk because I'm not talking. Hey, can we go get ice cream? Can we go to Starbucks? Can we go get something to eat? Can you have us all over to eat? You know, which I fell for. And so I need to remind me again. I need to tell my wife that. I forgot. But there's just a part of it. I go, but they're coming to me rather than me always pursuing them. And that's what I want. And I've realized it's me being quiet. It's not, I mean, I, I think the, the way I get along with my grandkids, for you grandparents, is that I don't have any rules in our house. I'm not telling them what they can do, what they can't do. I'm not telling them what to wear, what not to wear. I mean, my, my daughter, my granddaughter, brought over a group of girls that came over after a volleyball game where they wear those butt crack. Be, you can't be wearing that. Don't go out. Go get some other pants or something. You know, I can do that because I have a relationship with them. We were talking about that earlier. But if I didn't know them, I'm not saying a word. I want them to know when they come to my house, it's a place of rest and encouragement. It's a place that, that I'll, I'll do anything for you. I'll cook your best meal. I'll do, I'll do whatever. But it's not going to be a point of correction. Sometimes if... If you're, um, if, I mean, I, I say this, I wonder if your kids feel like your home is a correction facility or a connection facility. Why don't you text them that right now and ask them, do you think I correct too much? Do you think I'm always telling you what to do different? Do you think... I'm always telling you how to do it better. Because if you do that, you're squelching your child. So do this. Only correct them on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Don't, but don't tell them those are the only days or you're going to have a mess on Tuesday and Thursday. But just stop the correcting. They're being corrected everywhere. They're trying to take the very gospel, the, the life that you poured into them and transport it into the world. And they're getting beat up every day. So they're succumbing to that. So if they come home and they get beat up more, what are they going to go do? They're going to go find some place to find rest. Your child has access to pot like crazy. So they go, oh no, not our kids. They would never smoke pot. 39% of girls have sent nude pictures. 42% of girls and 46% of guys between the ages of 15 and 17, within the last six months, 
in this country have engaged in oral sex? Look at the Center for Disease Control studies that they do. And you go, well, my kid will never do that. Be careful. Your kids are no different than the kids that live with us. When you hear them tell their stories, they will do anything to connect. You follow me so far? Is that scary a little bit? It's scary to me. It makes me want to go, I want to spend more time with you. It puts things in priority. When you, if, if I'm telling you that, that all the kids that I know that have committed suicide, nobody saw it coming, doesn't that scare you a little bit? That your child who may be fighting with depression or anxiety or being overwhelmed may take the same path because now it's a viable option for them. And girls are hanging themselves, shooting themselves, doing all these crazy things that it used to be just pills. They're doing it because they're hearing about Robin Williams and Kate Slade and uh, Anthony Bourdain and all the other ones that have committed suicide. They hear about it, so they're doing the same thing but it's more acceptable and they get the attention. We had a little girl that was with us. Mother took her home. You would know who her grandmother is. She wrote this song, this Christmas song. Grandmother took her home and I said, don't take her home. It's not time. She needs to finish up. No, we're going to take her home. She needs to start a dance studio at a dance studio. And I go, it's a bad idea. I wouldn't do it. I wouldn't do it. Family's not ready, nobody's ready, so they, she takes her home anyway. She goes home and is living with her mother and stepdad. That lasts about a month. So she moved in with the grandmother and stepmother. And after five months, decided that nobody ever listened to her. And so she took her grandfather's forty-five caliber pistol, put it to her chest, and shot it. And lived, paralyzed from the chest down. She left an eight-page note. I don't think we have it on our Parenting Today's Teen site anymore, but we do have the radio program. I interviewed her for a couple of things. And she, she's a suicide survivor because she meant to shoot herself in the heart. It didn't. It just severed, went through and severed her spine, missed her heart. And, and she said, I just wanted somebody to listen to me. Becomes key. The next thing is here is, is, is instead of giving answers, it's moving and, and saying over here, I'm going to just start asking questions. You know, do the question thing. It'll change the dynamics of your family. And if observation, I'm sorry, if wisdom is gathered by observation, reflection, and experience, that which I see, that which I think about, and that which I experience, then, then I want to make sure that I'm spending time getting them to reflect on things. And that reflection is important because what that does is kind of mix up all the stuff that's in their head and gets them to think about things. You follow me? Asking the question, do you think God is, is so big that even he can create a rock that he couldn't pick up? Well, I've got to think about that. And that's what you want. You want them to talk about the things that nobody wants to talk about. Hey, what do you think about this? What do you think about that? You know, you have a, a, a time at your home where it's a, uh, a no-tech Tuesday, right? Where you put your phones away. Nobody gets to use them at the dinner table. No-tech Tuesday. But I would suggest you have an all-tech Thursday. That everybody in your house has a phone and you text them when it's time to eat dinner. And the rules are this. You have to answer every question and nobody can talk. And if you talk, you lose your phone for two weeks. They come to eat, ding, 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 around the house, and so everybody's running down to eat. Okay, sit down, ding, 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 ding. Everybody sits down. Type out a prayer. Send the prayer, ding, 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 ding. Everybody, amen, 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 amen. <laughs> they do the amen thing. And they go, in one word, tell me, you write this, dad or mom, in one word, tell me how your week was this week. Ding, send it out. You're getting ding, 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 ding. Now it's coming back. If you can change one thing about our family, what would that be? Ding, 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 ding. Everybody's got to answer. You're going to lose your phone. And then ask this question. If you can change one thing about me, what would it be? 
ding, 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 ding. And whatever they say, don't correct them. Don't excuse it. Don't tell them how they should have answered a different way, how they can do it better next time. Just listen. But what you find is two things. You start asking them questions, a lot of questions at different times. It stirs up all the things that you've been planted and taught them here. Because what you're trying to do is get them to think about here where they can start making good decisions. Are you following me on that? So the question stirs up things, but it's also doing this. It gives them an example of how to ask questions. Because what I want is for kids to come back to me and say, hey, Mark, can we ask you a question? Well, you just did, but yes. Hey, what do you think about this abortion thing? And, and what's my answer? I don't give them an answer. My answer is this. I don't know. I need to think about it. Because the minute that I give them an answer, they quit thinking. And I want them to think it through. Are you following me? Hey, Mark, if God is so good, then why did that boat run over my parents' boat and kill both of them and I'm alive? I don't know. But I don't stop there. I don't try to fix it. I don't try to be like Stitch and say, well, your parents crossed the rainbow bridge. Then it sounds kind of stupid. Let's talk about that. Let me think. So I get time to think about it. But I'm sure not going to give her the answer. I want them to think. And there's very few people that are challenging them to think in those ways. And it's just by, by, by asking questions. Quit giving the answers to everything. You follow me? Here's another piece. Is that is it move from telling to sharing. Um, move from lecture to discussion. Lecture, <laughs> lecture doesn't work anymore. I'm going to sit them down and have a lecture with them. It doesn't work. Andragogy is the study of adult learning. They say that teens can absorb maybe 4 per 5% of a lecture. It doesn't work. What you've got to have is a discussion. If you guys don't know how to talk, do this. You talk. And when you're finished, you pass this back to me. Whatever that is. Now I get to talk. When I'm finished... Now you get to talk. Very practical ways of doing that. There's times that, that kids will not say what they want to say, but they sure will text about it. So I've sat down, got my wife's phone, and I'll sit down with a young man across from me, and we're going to have a discussion just through text, sitting down across the table at a restaurant from one another, just coming back and forth, having a discussion. You can't lecture on a phone with text. And so what I'm doing is just, I just want to engage. They, they love it. They absolutely love it. And part of it is because they love having a discussion rather than this lecture. And maybe have a sign for your spouse when you start lecturing, you know, go like this. No. <laughs> Lecture, you know, or <laughs> just go. I mean, it's like me and my wife, when, my, when Jan interrupts, I go, It's just a sign. When she's trying to teach all the time, you know, I go, do I have little signs like that? When people come up to me and I get stuck in a conversation I need to get out of, you know what the universal sign is among some people? And that means help, get me out of this. And they do. Our staff will come over and go, hey, well, Mark, you've got a call that, or Mark, you've got Mark, Mark, Mark. So there's a part of it where I go, it's okay to do that as a spouse. My tendency has a, my wife has a tendency to lecture. I have a tendency to make jokes about stuff. She'll just look at me and go, roll her eyes at me. Just goes. And I need that because it's the balance of both of us. But part of this thing with lecture, it doesn't work anymore. Move from a sense of punishment, which, is, which works well in a teaching model, here 
to discipline. And discipline is helping a child get to the point, you know, get to a point where they want to go and keeps them from where they don't want to go. And what shifts about this when you change your parenting style from teaching to training, what that means is, is that instead here, I'm kind of the enemy. Here, I become an ally. And this becomes important when we talk about building these rules and, and all the stuff that we're, we're going to talk about here in a little while, uh, about developing rules and consequences for your home. You want them to know that you are an ally with them and you're helping get them to a good spot. And so the next thing is this, move from words to actions. You get the idea that you need to say more. Let me tell you something. It's all about your actions. Your kids are watching you like a hawk. They are watching the way you treat people, the way you walk out of church, the way when you get in your car, the comments you make, how you drive down the highway, how you treat that waitress or, can you call them waitresses or... Whatever. It's so retarded. But, but they, I mean, they are watching you like a hawk. And they, I mean, because why? Because your actions speak louder than words. Isn't that amazing? Actions speak louder than words. It's not what you say, it's what you... When Scripture says, let us not just be, use words, but let us what? Act. It, when you get to this point... Your words have very little. I mean, your actions speak louder than any words that you can say. Because it also gives them a living example. When I made the comment this morning about 1 Thessalonians 2, where it says, remember how we were devoutly and uprightly and blameless among you. This is what this is about. That your actions are blameless. And they see that. And because they see that, they go, I want to be like my mom. I want to be like my dad. I want to be like grandpa. I want to be like grandma. It's because you have put all these words here into play and into actions. You follow me? Another one is it moves from you doing it here because you're doing everything for them to now them doing it. It moves from your responsibility for them to now you're wanting to build responsibility into them. And when you do that, what you find is, is, that, is that the byproduct of, of the assumption of responsibility when you start to transfer that is that it moves from immaturity to maturity. That's the only way that, that, that they're going to mature is by you giving it to them. You can't be hovering over them all the time. You can't, you, you just can't do that all the time. You can't be one of these parents that won't let your child do anything. You know, at some point, your child's got to suffer the consequences of their choices in the current of society. I mean, it's not you bailing them out all the time. If you rescue your child once, you're just going to have to rescue them again. The scripture says that if you rescue an angry man, you have to, you just rescue him again. It, it, there's another proverb that said, uh, um, discipline your son while there's yet hope and don't participate in his death. That's kind of scary, isn't it? And that's where this provision quickly moves to enabling. So it's basically, I want them to grow up. And so what that means is, more than anything, I'm going to have to let them start making some decisions early on. Now, this is the hard part, is when is when, yeah, truly, when your child's messing up and making stupid choices and you've got some guy with a mustache in front of you saying, let him make more choices. But if the consequences are greater from the choices that they're making, they'll learn to make good choices. Until the pain from your child's actions is greater than the pleasure they get from those actions, they will continue in the behavior. And part of the pain is that we rescue them from it, where they don't feel the, feel the full effect of their actions. And we want them to learn that, don't we? Even though it's painful for us. But it's part of the process to say, okay, this is what I want my child. I want them to learn. And you let them learn. Why? C.S. Lewis says that pain is God's megaphone to a deaf world. It will wake them up. 
son, uh, that's interesting. You got a $400 ticket <laughs> for going 60 miles an hour through a, <laughs> through a school zone. Yeah. How are you going to pay for it? Well, I was thinking maybe you could. Nope. Well, what am I supposed to do? I don't know. Don't give him an answer. What do you think you ought to do? Well, I haven't thought about it. Maybe that's a good place to start. And don't try to solve it. Let him do it. If you're going, well, if you wash my car for the next five years, I'll give you the money. Don't do that. You're rescuing them. They need to feel the pinch. Well, I don't know what to do. Hmm. Well, <laughs> you can't help. Hmm. Because the point isn't my help at that time. My point is I'm giving them the opportunity to learn something. You want your child to be able to make good decisions by the time they leave home, don't you? Anybody want your child to not make good decisions when they leave home? No, I pretty much prefer to have a clown on a couch at age 25 playing video games. Of course, you don't want that. So it just means you've got to let them make decisions. There's a little girl in Tishomingo, Oklahoma, that four months ago, she didn't quite make the best decision in the world. She came up to a highway. This is where Blake Shelton lives, this little town. She came up to a highway Instead of pushing her brakes all the way to the floor, she pumped them and then went through the stop sign. She could have just pushed it that much further. Her split decision, her split second decision to pump something that much further, to see the need to do that, she missed it. Ran out on the highway, killed all six girls in the car instantly. A semi ran into it changed the destiny of their families. It's changed the destiny of Tishomingo, Oklahoma. It changed this high school. All because she didn't know how to make a decision. You can tell when your child doesn't know how to make decisions because they end up marrying the wrong person. Are you following me? Because they don't know how to, I don't know how to make a decision. And you want them to do that. So they pick the right person, so they parent the right way. And so it's, it's saying this, what decisions can you give to your child now to help them? At age 12, you're going to church every day. You're going to go. You're going to go on Monday night mission project, Tuesday night Bible study, prayer group on Wednesday night, Thursday morning is uh, worship team. Friday, you're going to prepare yourself for the Sabbath. <laughs> on, on Saturday, you're going to pray all day. And Sunday, you're going to go to every one of the services. And on Monday, you're going to start all over again. At age 13, you don't have to do the Saturday thing. And we can cut back on some of the stuff. Age 14, I want you to be in church, go to youth group, do these things. At age 15, I want you to Go to church, be involved in a youth group. I want you to be involved in one other thing at school. When you're 16, I want you to go to church somewhere. Somewhere. But you got to go. You follow me? 17. You don't have to go if you don't want. But if you don't go, would you join us for lunch? Because we're eating at whatever's a great restaurant around here. What am I doing? I'm empowering my child to make decisions. I'm teaching them how to make decisions. I'm giving it the input that I need here, but I'm releasing it here so they're making good decisions. But here's the other thing. They can't use it against you anymore. Well, my mom's making me go to church. My dad's making me go to church. Especially if they start struggling a little bit. They'll blame you for it. In some way. And, and let me just say, when, when your child starts to struggle, they're going to love the thing that you hate the most, and they're going to hate the thing that you love the most. So if you love Jesus, it's going to be the first thing that goes out the window. Because it's a way to get back at you in some way. 
Your child wants to make decisions. They want to be in control. They want to move to a point, they want to move to a point where they are independent. Here they have a great dependence on you. Here they need to be independent. Move them to that. When your child begins to say, you know, I'm 16, I could probably live on my own. I think I could do it. What do you do? Well, what are you going to do about health insurance? What are you going to do about car insurance? Where are you going to live? Do you know how much that costs? you know what taxes are? Well, by law, what do you just do? Your child is displaying that he wants to be independent. Yes. And you're starting to feed him a bunch more information. I tell him, you know, that sounds like a pretty good idea. Can we do it now? No, I'm not. (laughs) But there's a part where you just go, you know, maybe maybe we can think about that. Because you probably could live on your own. But there may be some things for you to consider. I didn't answer him yet. What I want him to say is, really? Hey, Dad, well, what would I have to consider? I don't know. Let me think about it. See how I don't have to know everything? And it gives me time to really think about it, but it also gives him time to think about it. Why don't we go out and eat dinner in a couple of nights and, and uh, we'll talk about it. See, what I'm doing is putting everything on him. I'm putting everything on her. I'm transferring things and saying, I want you to be in control. I want you to take responsibility. I want you to make decisions. I want you to do those things. Because it's, 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 it's not about me anymore. It's about me down here. When you get up here, it's not about you anymore. Remember Rick Warren, the book that he wrote, Purpose Driven Life? Did any of y'all read that? What's the first line of the book? It's not about you. And when you get to here, it's all about them. So what that means is, I'm going to help you get to a healthy spot and make it where you're independent. That doesn't mean you can't give them things and you can't do all this. You can offer all that you want. But it just means they're going to be prepared to face the world that they're going to live in. So it, it's moving them there. It's moving so that they are, that, you know, this is where I want um, them to have an understanding of me and what I want for them. Here, I want to understand them more. I want to sit back and go, I want to know who you are. This is where I am in control. This is where I am passing control to them. Following me? This is where I'm, I'm demanding perfection here. This is where I'm allowing imperfection. Why do I allow imperfection, even in my own life? Do you like being with somebody that's perfect? I don't. (laughs) They get here and they begin to realize that the world is not perfect. So if I have to come home and live with a perfect person, what do they do? They shun you because, they, because you're judging them without knowing it. The mere fact that you're perfect or think you're perfect and now they're imperfect because they're realizing that in their world, they're going to shun you a little bit. So I would tell you to do this. Start sharing some of your imperfections. And that'd be hard for some of you. But if you're asking questions and you're training your child to... to ask you questions. This is what you're waiting for. It's what you're waiting for. Your daughter to come to you and say, hey, mom, 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 you and dad ever have sex before you got married? (laughs) I got to make sure I look at everybody in here because somebody's going to go, if I look at you too long, you're going to go, did you tell him? And, uh, (laughs) but I got to make sure I'm looking at everybody. But it's what you're waiting for. It's what you've been practicing for. And so you can come back and you can say, well, I don't want you to have sex because in Scripture it says 23 times that the the marriage bed should be undefiled and and you need to keep yourself for this and we're going to give you five purity rings and wrap one around your neck and make you eat eat two of them. I mean, it's just, it's, it's... What am I doing? I'm jumping back here and giving them information. 
when that's not what they want. What have you observed? What have you reflected on? And what have you experienced? I want you to know that Dad and I did have sex before we got married. And I regret it. I wish we wouldn't have. Because I have found with other people that sex before marriage confuses relationships. And I could have lost your dad over that whole thing. I don't have to share what I believe and I don't have to share scripture. I'm sharing the wisdom that I've gathered in my life to impact her. And that's why we're so strong about you not being out in the car with Billy or Shane or whoever. That's why we're so strong and probably too strict because we've been there and we know the hurt that it's caused. Do you see how it's a different answer than just sharing information? Dad, this is which when your son comes to you and says, hey, dad, 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 <laughs> you ever smoke pot in high school? Um, no, but your mother has. <laughs> And you can tell them, I don't want you smoking pot because it'll damage the frontal lobe of your brain. And there's an amazing way that you'll, all your babies will be born naked. And you can't, you know, <laughs> what am I doing? I'm over here giving him a much more information, which he doesn't want. And you miss out on the opportunity of sharing wisdom, which he does want. Son, yeah, I did. I smoked a lot of pot. I don't think it was near as near as dangerous or maybe as strong as it is now. But this is what I found. This is what I found is that, is that kids who smoke pot during their teen years lose motivation. They don't end up where, um, where they want to be. I've noticed when I've gone back to my 20-year reunion, they're still smoking pot now. They're just as lazy as we're, but they're just unfulfilled. That's why I don't want you smoking when you're 21, you can go do whatever you want. When I'm not paying for college, do what you want. It's your life. I can love you whether you smoke pot or you don't. But what am I doing? I'm sharing wisdom. I'm sharing my own imperfection that proves why I'm so intense about engaging with them. I'm answering his question because he's asking me a question. Are you following the process here? So, I mean, and the whole thing is this. Let me go to this next one, and we'll get through it here. Crafting character here, here your coaching character. This is this is about what you do. This is about who you are. This is where the Christian life is taught. This is where the, this is where the Christian life is caught. And the reason you do this and change the way that I'll fix this during the break. The the reason you're doing this, you cannot change your child. There isn't one kid that's been at Heartlight that we've changed. We've created an arena for change to happen. But what you'll find out is there's only one person in this room that you can change, and that's you. You can create the atmosphere to be something different. You can love your child differently by not getting so consumed by the behavior that you miss out on the most important thing, which is the relationship. And so what that means is that, that, that I, can, I can spend time and engage with them and let them see something different and give them a living example of the word becoming flesh and dwelling among them. That out of the abundance of my heart, the mouth speaks the wisdom of God itself. Now, if you want to, don't do this. Well, son, John 14, 6, 3 through 7 says, because you just took away your authority. And somebody says, well, that's what Scripture says. No, man added those parts in there. You know, all the divisions and stuff. But it gives you the opportunity to share from the abundance and you back it up with your life. Because there's only one person you can change. And I'm talking about changing things in little bits. Some of your kids would quit smoking pot if they would just have a place of rest when they come home. Some of them wouldn't be drunk all the time if, Dad, you weren't trying to fix them all the time. Some of them wouldn't be, truly wouldn't be 
doing whatever they're doing, ignoring you, if you wouldn't shame them all the time through your constant correction. And so it, it really is, if, if behavior is a response to you and you can't change them, okay, I'm finished here in a minute, then, then if that's my wife, tell her that 16 people are coming over <laughs> Wednesday night to eat. <laughs> but what that means is that, that I, I, I mean, you, you just look at, look at what's before you and you say, I can change me. And in time, that will change them. But it's not going to happen just by me coming up with rules like that. And you change little things, and you'll see big differences. And what I find, it's not usually the major things that, that cause a dysfunctional family. It's little things. Little things.